Hello everyone. Hi. Uh, thanks for joining us for this webinar on the behalf of the SMF. I would like to thank you all for attending today's training webinar. Uh, honestly, it's good to see all of you. So uh, let me start by introducing myself. Uh, I'm David and I'm your MC for today. We are all very excited and proud to be working with Rolls Royce for this training series. So I'd like to preface a little bit and say that I'm not an industry expert. So if, but if you're a lay person like me uh, that, that you know, is new to this whole uh, industry, you must be wondering what is uh, IIoT and how it can apply to your business. So our webinars series will, today will cover that and I'm sure that we will all come out of this discussion with a much better and much greater understanding of the technological forces that are shaping this industry. But let's start with one ground rule, right? Uh, during the course of this webinar, if you have any questions that you would like answered, I, I ask that you uh, do not hesitate to ask them through our chat function. You can find it below your screen, uh, below, uh, I can't mark it up for you, but uh, the, there's a chat function there that you will be able to share your comments and your questions. Now, uh, yeah, without further ado, let me introduce our trainer for today. Uh, our trainer for today is uh, Mr. Sachin Gupta. He's the chief of the IoT capability group over at Rolls-Royce Singapore. Mr. Sachin will be sharing on track and trace, and more specifically on indoor and outdoor asset tra tracking technologies. Uh, Mr. Sachin is also responsible for the development of innovative technologies to support Rolls-Royce core businesses, such as uh, civil aerospace, defense, and power systems. Uh, and he's also in charge of uh, driving digital culture and accelerating uh, IoT capabilities here in Singapore. So Mr. Sachin, I, I pass the mic over to you. Thank you, Javin. First of all, very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Sachin here. Uh, I'd like to thank SMF, first of all, uh, to in, inviting us uh, today here for this webinar series. Uh, I, as uh, Devin mentioned, I lead the IoT Capability Group uh, here uh, in Singapore for Rolls-Royce. And together with me today, I've got my colleague, Karthik, and both of us are gonna take you all through the IoT track and trace uh, use cases and technologies, and how can it be applied in, in the manufacturing uh, environment. Karthik, if we can move, uh, sorry, before if we can uh, jump into the session, let me, let me touch a little bit about uh, IoT. Now, we have all heard uh, from our you know, business leaders or from the industry a term called digital transformation. And uh, you know, I can bet if we go and ask different people uh, what does digital means, everyone will come out with a very different answer on digital. Now, what I can say is uh, digital is not about uh, having an e-commerce website. It is not about... Uh, uh, putting comments on Facebook or Inst uh, Instagram or Twitter. The word digital actually means the pace at which the technology is changing around us uh, due to the rapid adoption of technology. And for many companies, if we don't transform ourselves, uh, we will be out of business in the next couple of years or in the uh, near future. And at the very heart of that digital transformation lies IoT or Internet of Things that provides underpinning technologies uh, for businesses to transform into many ways. Uh, from digital services to digital product to digital uh, connectivity and so on and on. Uh, with that thought in mind, uh, let's go uh, into our today's session. Uh, Karthik, if you can move to the next slide, please. All right, we'll, we'll very quickly touch on uh, introduction part, uh, what we do in Rolls-Royce, uh, you know, and how do we, uh, how, how we are using IoT's technologies into different businesses. Karthik will then take us through uh, some of the technical uh, uh, know-hows about uh, and the technologies in details about track and trace. And then we'll, we'll also look at some of the use cases and towards the end, uh, we'll definitely should have a lot of time to uh, answer some of the questions and uh, Q and A's. Karthik, if you can move, yeah, next slide. All right, quick uh, introduction, uh, who we are. So Rolls-Royce, uh, we are one of the world's leading industrial technology companies. And uh, at Rolls-Royce, we make advanced propulsion systems that connect uh, power and protect society in the most efficient way as possible. We're also a leading company when it comes to R&D investments, both in UK and Singapore. Uh, we invest in technologies uh, that's gonna form a new standard uh, for future propulsion technologies. And to solve some of the uh, advanced challenges, we set ourselves into a transformation journey over the last couple of years, which comprises of three things. One, 
how can we uh, uh, revitalize our current capabilities? That means how can we increase uh, productivity and efficiency of our manufacturing and service operations? Uh, number two, how can we champion electrification? Uh, you know, uh, investing and exploring hybrid electrical uh, technologies, uh, investing more into microgrids and renewables. And the last thing is, uh, which we're talking today is, is reinventing ourselves with digital uh, in whatever we do, because we believe uh, digital is the low carbon data tool, uh, which is going to help us improve our manufacturing and operations going forward. Next slide, please. Uh, we operate in three businesses, uh, civil aerospace business, uh, where we power the likes of large body aircrafts, uh, uh, 380s, 350s, 777s, and we have globally about 13,000 engines in service today around the world. In power systems business, we provide the reciprocating engines uh, uh, for uh, large mining trucks, uh, ships, ferries. So if you take Singapore Bintan Ferry, that's powered by Rolls-Royce engine. Uh, oh. Also, we provide uh, backup generation oh. to... Hi, Ross, can you... Uh, also, uh, we provide backup generation to a lot of data centers uh, on the power systems uh, business. Uh, for defense business, uh, we, we have about globally 16,000 engines today around the world uh, with 150 customers. And we also provide uh, uh, the advanced uplift technologies uh, for the uh, likes of F-35 aircrafts. If we can move to the next. When it comes to Singapore, uh, in our Celeta campus, we have, we've got a, a fan blade manufacturing facility. Uh, we've got an assembly plant uh, where we assemble Trent 1000 and a lot of other uh, uh, wide body aircraft engines. We've got a MRO facility uh, near Changi, which is joint venture between Rolls-Royce and, and Singapore Airlines. Uh, we've got a power systems business unit uh, in Tukang. And then we are also uh, embedded very deeply into the local R&T ecosystem. We have got a corporate lab with the NTU where we look at some of the advanced and future technology programs for sensors, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, electrical, new materials, a lot of other things. Uh, we work with ASTAR uh, on a lot of uh, uh, research and uh, ongoing technologies. So ARTC is one of the examples where we have uh, one of the biggest uh, smart manufacturing program uh, going on today. Uh, we also support iCube, IIoT Center with ASTAR, uh, which is a public-private uh, relationship uh, to promote uh, IIoT adoption in the industry and solve some of the common challenges. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that explains uh, how much uh, we spend and how, how deeply we are integrated in the Singapore ecosystem. If we can move to the next. Now, when it comes to IoT, uh, our strategy is pretty simple. Uh, one, how can we look into today's technology and immediately apply that technology in our business and get value out of it. So whether the technology is about uh, digital in-service, providing EHM capabilities, you know, knowing, uh, uh, servicing our engines before something happens, whether it's part tracking in the facilities, condition monitoring or predictive uh, maintenance of our machines in the manufacturing plant, and then immediately improve our efficiency and, and realize, realizing the value into the business. At the same time, we work with... Also, uh, Sorry, can we mute everyone else, uh, Devin, if it's okay? Uh, at the same time, we work with uh, universities, startup companies, SMEs, uh, to understand more about evolving technologies such as 5G, blockchain, nanosensors, uh, energy harvesting, uh, high temperature electronics. And our vision is basically uh, come out with IoT technology that we can spray across on our products as the product goes in, uh, from design to manufacture and in-service operations. Uh, and then do make some data-driven decisions which can help provide better service to our customers. Patrick, if we can move to the next slide. So in Rolls-Royce, we, uh, for IoT, we follow a, a model called a SATA model, uh, which is basically essentially nothing but sense uh, acquire, transmit, analyze, and act. So sense over here is, is the sensing part, uh, which, which covers the harsh environment sensors, the micro devices, which enables use cases such as predictive maintenance, and also the edge gateways uh, that, that you need to connect to your machines or PLCs to get the data uh, from the machine to the cloud. Uh, the connectivity part uh, basically comprises of two things, right? So one is a, a short, or near-term connectivity, which we're going to talk today, which is Bluetooth or RFID or Zigbee or UWB technologies, 
or you know uh, outdoor technologies which are based on uh, uh, LoRaWAN or white space or GSM technologies uh, which pretty much comprises of use cases of track and trace when it comes to analyze uh, we kind of focus on cloud and uh, uh, IoT platforms so how can we uh, visualize uh, this data into dashboards how can we you know quickly see uh, how can we provide mobile apps to the operators to quickly enable some local decisions and then how can we have standardization of uh, IoT data and all devices across our uh, different plants uh, globally uh, IoT safety and security is nothing but you know how do we ensure the sensor data is secure uh, are we going to follow uh, AI for security or security for AI for critical infrastructure production protection? And then, you know, how do we apply it uh, globally as we scale uh, from pre-OC to production? And then last piece is the IoT analytics, which is all about making data-driven decisions. So once you have sensor, once you have gateway, once you start collecting data over months, we can then build predictive models, which can be uh, pushed to edge device to make local decisions. That's what we call it embedded analytics or Edge analytics, and then you know that that actually evolves into many other applications such as augmented reality or different other artificial intelligence tools uh, to help us get better. If we can move to the next slide, please. So essentially, uh, there are four things that we do uh, today uh, when it comes to IoT. One, we work with, we co-create with our customers. So we have a research uh, agreement with Singapore Airlines Engineering Company. We're solving some common challenges of track and trace around the airport. Uh, so how do we, uh, you know, uh, look at tracking technologies for both indoor and outdoor for our assets that's in, on the ground and, and internationally. Second is uh, connecting our products. So we work with power systems uh, business, uh, connecting our fleet. Globally, we'll talk about that use case uh, later uh, in the session. Third is uh, the predictive maintenance uh, and the, uh, you know, condition monitoring of our assets and machines in the plants. Uh, that's essentially uh, enables uh, uh, industry 4.0 uh, applications. And then lastly, we work with, as I said, with universities and with uh, ASTAR in long-term capability acquisitions, such as uh, 5G, blockchain, harsh environment sensors, and bring it, uh, as, as, as the technology gets matured, we can then look into bringing those technologies into inside Rolls-Royce. Now with this uh, introduction, I'd like to pass the session to Karthik, uh, to take us through some of the tracking technologies and uh, in the next session. Yes, Karthik, over to you. Uh, thanks, Sachin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm part, I'm part of the IoT capabilities group here in Singapore. I'll give you a brief uh, overview of the technical aspects of asset tracking. Uh, so I would like to start off with first on the power of asset tracking. Uh, this is a technology that enables products, assets, and resources to be visible throughout the value chain. And this, in turn, translates into a lot of use cases, such as inventory management, visitor tracking, employee safety, supply chain tracking, theft reduction, and asset utilization. Uh, so when we look at asset tracking, uh, there are two main streams that we come across. The first one, we call it as indoor tracking, and the second stream is outdoor tracking. Uh, the commonality that comes across these two streams are three main technologies and this is defined by first a localization method so suppose you have an asset tracker the first thing you need is it should get the coordinates uh, this is enabled by a certain set of technologies the second thing is communications that is once you have the coordinate you need to send it to a cloud for a dashboarding or analytics so this is an, another important criteria for selection and finally, coming to the energy source, that is, uh, there are two types of trackers. One is active and passive trackers. Uh, typically, we use a lot of active trackers because they give you real-time visibility of the system. And in this case, it will definitely have some battery power. To go a bit more deep into localization method, uh, there's a lot of technologies in the market. Uh, let me just brief on a few of them and also address some of the questions that we need to ask ourselves in choosing the right technology. Uh, the first technology that's very common is RFID. Typically, you see it in supermarkets where you have high value products. And the idea here is that suppose a person takes a product uh, where the tag is not removed, then you get an alarm in the gantry. And this alarm itself indicates that it has sensed the tag and it gives you a localization update that the product is in this particular area. The second technology that is very common is Bluetooth. Uh, Bluetooth is uh, short range communications, uh, but it can also be used for proximity, proximity distance uh, uh, estimation. It's very popular because most of our smartphones already do have the Bluetooth feature and 
it's very easy to get this set up and it's very low cost. Uh, the third technology that is getting very popular now is called as ultra wide band. Uh, this is primarily for indoor localization where you can actually get an accuracy of a couple of centimeters. So suppose you have some AGV type of use cases and you want to define a path for it. Now, this is the technology to choose. Um, of course, we do have cellular triangulation that is uh, normally when we uh, communicate using cellular, it's possible to know which base station we communicated to with and you can actually inverse map where the asset is located at. Uh, but of course, you're going to get a lot of error because it will just localize to the district. You cannot pinpoint where actually the asset is. But it does help in some use cases where you want to know if it has reached a country or not. The next popular technology that is GPS, we are well aware of it. It's primarily used for all smartphones, but also for uh, vehicle asset trackers. Um, the only key disadvantage here is that if you use GPS trackers, it works only outdoor. You need to have a line of sight to the sky uh, for it to get the coordinates. Uh, once you go indoor, you need to use other technologies to complement this information. And finally, coming to barcodes, again, this is a legacy technology. It's basically a barcode on a label. Uh, we use this a lot for factories because we can just put a label on an asset. As it moves throughout the shop floor, uh, you can actually scan it at different cells. And by scanning it, you can actually know this asset is in this particular cell. So uh, looking at these technologies, uh, in order to choose, there are certain questions we need to ask ourselves. The first one is going to be, uh, for a particular use case, what is the accuracy requirement uh, that we need to actually address? Um, the second thing is we're going to look at active or passive tags because uh, sometimes battery power tags may be very difficult to maintain or maybe the asset is too small. So in this case, we need to actually uh, revert back to passive tags like labels. The third question we're going to ask is, are we looking at indoor or outdoor uh, technology because GPS works outdoor, but for indoor, we have other set of technologies such as Wi-Fi. And finally, the fourth question is going to be on the infrastructure. So infrastructure, we have two options. So suppose you have a shop flow, it's possible for us to set up our own localization infrastructure such as uh, Bluetooth gateways. But it's also possible that uh, once you go outdoor, you can use uh, existing infrastructure like GPS uh, that is already defined and existing. Uh, now, if you want to answer these questions, of course, you need to research it online. There's a lot of charts available online. There's one example I'm showing over here, which actually compares uh, what is the accuracy received uh, achieved by each of these technologies? So if you look at one end of the spectrum, you have Bluetooth that gives you an accuracy of three to five meters. And on the other end, you have cellular uh, triangulation that can give you an accuracy of uh, the worst case error is going to be around five kilometers. Um, moving on to the second technology of communication. Again, we do have a list of technologies here. Uh, let's start with cellular technology. This is the most common. Uh, basically, if you have an asset tracker which uh, uses cellular for communication, you need to buy a SIM card, install it, uh, and then you will be able to directly get connected to the internet. Uh, the second option that we have is something called as LoRa. Uh, it works in the same range of cellular, but the key advantage here is that you can have private deployments. So suppose you want to get coverage of communication for around 500 uh, meters, you can set up a gateway in your premise and get uh, communication to these asset trackers. The other advantage here is going to be that a lot of based uh, devices are going to be really low power. So you can actually uh, reduce your operating cost for your tracking solution. Uh, as I mentioned last time that uh, Bluetooth can be used for both. It can be used for proximity alerts, but also it can be used for communication. So it's another technology that's being used, like you can use your mobile phone like a gateway to connect to the asset and relay this information back to the cloud. Uh, one of the upcoming technologies is something called as LiFi, that is using light for communication. Uh, this is typically used in warehouses where you can change the lighting infrastructure, uh, but the cons is going to be that, of course, you need to have a light of sight between the asset and the light source. Um, the next technology is Wi-Fi. Uh, Wi-Fi is very popular because we already use it in most of our premises. But from asset tracking point of view, we still see that it's used in very few use cases because it's a very high bandwidth uh, protocol, but it gives you, it consumes a lot of power. So it's not typically used for most of our applications. Uh, finally, coming to satellite, uh, this is the only option that we have when we do not have cellular coverage or any other infrastructure. So when you look at remote areas or 
suppose you're sending cargo via sea shipment uh, the only option you have for communication is going to be satellite there is a lot of tractors in the market which has a really low operating cost and can be adopted in some cases the questions that we're going to ask here is going to be first is on the power requirement that is how much power is required to power the communication module uh, this dictates the size of your tracker uh, because if the tracker is too big you cannot install it on a very small asset the second thing you're going to look at is reliability um, so we have two options so suppose you have a private infrastructure it's possible for you to actually uh, tweak it in a way that you can actually get a very good uh, sla based on it uh, but when you use public infrastructure like uh, third-party isps uh, this may not be the case always so it depends on your use case on what is your reliability requirement and then you can choose a technology for it uh, the third question you're going to look at is are you looking at global or uh, local um, environment so typically some of our assets actually travel across the globe and in that case uh, if you're using cellular you need to use a global cellular sim card and also you need to make sure your module supports the different frequency band for the different countries uh, finally coming to infrastructure again as i mentioned uh, it depends on your use case you can either go for a private installation of your infrastructure for communication or you can actually uh, reuse something from third party like uh, the isps in your country and again you have a list of charts you need to actually do your research online in order to find which is the right communication technology for your use case uh, there's just one example here where you can see uh, it's a mapping between the distance for each of the protocols and the bandwidth that is supported by it the next technology that i would like to focus is on the energy source so typically if you want to have real-time tracking of course you need to have some power uh, either it can be mains powered or it can be battery powered so for battery you have two main options the first option is a non-rechargeable battery that you can just buy off the shelf uh, maybe after eight months when the battery is depleted you can actually schedule a maintenance service for the tracker to change the batteries uh, the key advantage of using these cells is because um, it has a very long shelf life so if your tracker is sending very infrequently it can actually last a couple of years and also it works for a wide uh, temperature range the other option that we have is rechargeable batteries this is more cheap it's easier to maintain but you need to know that maybe after eight months you need to remove the battery charge it and place it back so the logistics for this can be a bit cumbersome at times um, apart from this we do have options for having uh, harvesters uh, one option for harvesting is solar where your tracker has a solar panel if it is outdoor you can harvest energy uh, store it in a battery and even at night when there's no sun you can actually send out information from your tracking devices uh, the other option is also mains powered uh, this is typically used like for example you have your car uh, it already has a battery and it's guaranteed to actually provide power to like your socket uh, you can actually connect a tracker to it and you don't need to really worry about the battery of your tracker itself uh, the last two options is another option for harvesting uh, these are again very niche cases one is rfid harvesting where you have cards uh, once it comes into an electromagnetic um, antenna region it can actually harvest energy and after it has accumulated energy it can uh, send out some information out and the second option that we have for uh, niche cases is something called as piezoelectric harvesting this is typically used for suppose you have some vibrating machine uh, you can actually harvest the vibrations itself to recharge your batteries and this gives you a longer service life on a single charge there are just two main questions here for deciding what is your energy source the first one deals with the form factor that you're looking at so suppose you want a tracker to last for a very long time of course you can in increase the number of batteries it has but uh, that makes the tracker bigger so for smaller assets you may need to look at something that's more power efficient rather than a bigger capacity uh, the second option is uh, second question that you need to ask is on the operating cost that is you need to note that if you're using active tracking there will be some recurring maintenance uh, cost involved because you need to uh, schedule the servicing of these batteries uh, typically this is done using the cloud platform where you put triggers or alerts so that it indicates to you when it's going to go off uh, the below chart actually shows you a quick snapshot on uh, the size versus the uh, distance covered by each of the tracking technologies. So what, in one end of the spectrum, you have very, uh, it's passive tags like RFID, which is really small, uh, but it has a very small service distance. And on the other spectrum, you have uh, global satellite trackers that are bigger because you need to have a bigger battery. 
uh, but it has a wide coverage. Uh, so if you look at these three technologies and if you go to the market, there's actually a lot of possible options you can choose from. So just to keep it simple, we actually propose this uh, simple flow chart that can be used for like 90% of your use cases. So suppose you have an outdoor tracking requirement. I think you just need to ask two questions. The first one is, does the asset have cellular coverage or not? If it does not have cellular coverage, your only option is going to be satellite uh, tracking and you can choose anything that's on the market for this. Uh, but if you're within a cellular coverage area, then you can actually answer the next set of questions. That is, uh, does your asset actually travel via air cargo? So if this is the case, then you can actually use uh, some certain trackers that have a flight save uh, certificate. So it can be actually transported such that it automatically switches off once it knows it's on board a uh, air cargo uh, plane. The second option that you need to think is, um, if your asset is primarily outdoor, it's always best to use the solar tracker. We have seen trackers in the market which can last about five to 10 years. So it actually reduces your maintenance burden for the particular application. And uh, the final case that we normally see is it's a combination of both uh, cellular and indoor tracking where uh, the asset is primarily indoor, uh, primarily outdoor, uh, but it can sometimes go indoor. So you can use a set of technologies such as GPS and also cellular triangulation to get the updates from the system. Uh, moving on to the indoor technology selector, uh, we have a different flowchart for this. The constraints here are uh, a bit more different. So this is primarily uh, depends on the number of assets you want to track first. That is, suppose you have a lot of assets, like thousands of assets, and it's important to note at this point of time that do you really want real-time tracking or you just want something like a check-in uh, check-out system? That is, you can have a manual scan at that particular point of time. So for this, we will always propose the uh, uh, passive technologies such as uh, passive RFID or barcode. Uh, this will reduce your maintenance burden. Uh, but suppose you want to have active tracking, that is a tracker that sends information every 10 seconds or one minute, you need to go for something that is between UWB or DLE. Uh, the main differentiator here is going to be that if you want very high accuracy, we can go for ultra wide band. Typically these trackers uh, can get an accuracy of less than 30 centimeters and the batteries can last for one or two years. The other option that we have is Bluetooth. Uh, using this technology, you can get only zonal accuracy, but the thing here is that the battery can normally last more than three to five years. So that's the trade-off you're gonna make uh, for a reduced accuracy. Uh, coming to the final portion, I want to just brief on, uh, when you look at IoT, uh, we do look at the solution architecture. It's a layered architecture where it starts from the physical layer consisting of trackers, uh, of different technologies. The next layer is going to be the trans transport layer where you have gateways or uh, base stations that provide this uh, facility. And once you have communication, you can actually connect it to your application layer, primarily residing in your cloud. There are two main services that you uh, install in the cloud. One is a database and there's going to be a web server. The web server is going to give you the presentation layer where you can actually uh, dashboard all this information either in a mobile platform or a web browser. Uh, the other thing to note is that, uh, of course, in the cloud, we do need some other supplementary services. One is you need a cloud infrastructure, but also you may need some APIs like uh, Google or Apple Maps in order to give you a map view of the system. Um, so if you look at all the solutions in the market, uh, there's various options to look at. Um, you can create your own proprietary solution using this architecture, but there is also subscription-based models where uh, vendors can actually give you the full subscription. You just buy trackers for them and pay on a monthly basis. They will take care of everything in the application and presentation layer to make uh, the solution more simpler for you. Uh, that's it from my side. Uh, let me hand over back to Sachin on the use cases. Sure, Karthik, thank you. So now that we have uh, understanding of different asset tracking technologies, let's look at uh, some of the examples like where and how we can apply uh, these technologies. So if you can go to the next slide here, Patrick. All right, the first uh, use case here that we've got is uh, outdoor tracking uh, application. Uh, and this is primarily to track our assets that's in the ground, right? And when I talk about assets, uh, you know, on the right, you can see an engine stand. Uh, and typically these are high value assets. 
Uh, each engine stand can cost anywhere in the range of 200 to 250 k pounds. And these uh, engine stands are the stands that uh, you know transport engine from one location to the location. Uh, there are also steps, stands, uh, you know, tow bars. There are a lot of other uh, tools that's uh, that's there uh, on ground to support the maintenance of your product. The the problem we've got is you know uh, often when you need this asset, you know, you'll spend one hour or two hours uh, just to locate this assets and uh, you know the productivity and the efficiency of the whole system goes down. So. By applying uh, track and trace technologies or by applying outdoor tracking technologies, uh, we can not only have real-time visibility to all these assets, but we can also uh, you know, create a platform where operator can go reserve these assets. You can actually see uh, the spaghetti diagram, how often the assets are used, was it supposed to be used for three hours by this particular operator, was it supposed to be you know, uh, uh, lying down in a particular location for that many hours, or if an asset is working or serviceable or non-serviceable, you can actually include that in, 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 a, in the same platform as well. Because what happens in a lot of normal scenarios is you go near to an asset and then you figure out that that particular asset is actually broken. So if, if it's not working, you can actually take a picture of this asset and upload uh, in the same platform and mark it as unserviceable. So the next guy uh, who tried to book it uh, knows that this asset is not uh, working. So we at Rolls-Royce, we have, we have actually connected uh, more than uh, 1,000 to 2,000 uh, assets globally now. In Singapore itself, we have uh, more than 200 over assets uh, uh, connected. And then uh, one of the things that uh, uh, always is buy and make decision where uh, whether we built our own platform or whether we use a uh, you know, third-party platform. And the reason we went with our own platform was because you know, we, we didn't want it to be uh, Locked down with one tracking company, there was uh, different trackers uh, for different use cases. Uh, so for the stands that don't leave the airport, they are out always outdoor. We, we went with the solar tracker. Uh, for the stands that move between one country to other countries to transport engines, uh, we went with a uh, outdoor tracker that is airworthiness approved. Uh, for different other assets, uh, there were battery operated GSM uh, uh, asset uh, trackers. And what we did is basically all these trackers combined and come together to one uh, platform and one visualization tool uh, that can help uh, improve the efficiency uh, of our uh, services operations. So that's, that's uh, one use case of applying uh, asset tracking uh, technology. The second uh, use case that I'm going to talk about is connecting our products or connecting uh, connected fleet actually. And this use case is with our power systems business. Uh, the power systems business, as I was saying earlier, uh, globally has about 450,000 customers. And often we don't know, uh, you know when the services was due or when the parts are due for replacement or when the engine needs total overhaul because you know, the services, uh, the sale has gone through a third party uh, reseller or a partner or the ship is, uh, uh, the engine is installed in the ship which is sailing in, in the Middle East or somewhere else. And then the data connectivity doesn't exist. Uh, so we went into a program where we started connecting all our products onto the fee, uh, fleet. Uh, there were high value assets like train and stuff which were connected directly with their ECUs. Uh, but this particular example I'm came, uh, giving is we came out with the, our own tracker, uh, basically which uses vibrations. And uh, uh, by using vibrations, uh, you can actually uh, note down the start and stop time of the engine. And uh, by having start and stop time of the engine, we can, the service engineer can give a call to the customer and say, hey, Mr. Customer, I understand your engine was running for 1,000 hours. Uh, can I come tomorrow for servicing? And since the vibrations are linked with the uh, uh, frequency uh, of the engine, we can actually, our RPMs, uh, we can also know what kind of tools uh, that service technician needs to bring. So if, if the RPM is idle uh, or the engine was not running uh, to the max power, we know uh, what tools should be replaced, or if the RPM was 1800 or, or 18,000, whatever it is, uh, we know what tool uh, uh, that needs to be uh, uh, taken to replace uh, or do maintenance of a particular engine. And of course, uh, lastly, on the communication size, uh, we, we chose uh, uh, a 3G or a USSD based uh, technology. Uh, USSD is basically uh, uh, communication technology, a messaging technology that we used to use in old days, uh, uh, like Star Hex 100 uh, to get our messages. And this technology is globally available. Uh, it's very low cost. Uh, and we embedded this technology into this tracker. We, we worked with a startup to help develop this tracker for us. 
And then, you know, today we have uh, deployed more than 10,000 of these trackers globally. And uh, the ambition is to actually connect 70 over 1,000 engines in the next uh, couple of years. Uh, again, uh, the idea is to have a connected fleet and then, you know, have a new type of relationship with our customer where we know uh, when to service a particular thing or when we, uh, the, the thing is going to fail uh, and have a better uh, solution for our customers. The third type of uh, use case uh, for track and trace technologies uh, that we have uh, gone in uh, uh, in Rolls Royce is indoor uh, track and trace uh, localization. So basically, uh, the use case over here is uh, there are two use cases. One is, uh, of course, uh, you know there are a lot of uh, fixtures, tools uh, that's within the plants or in the manufacturing plant or within the MRO space that needs to be tracked. Uh, we don't know uh, uh, where they are uh, in the plant a lot of times, and you know that uh, uh, brings the efficiency down. But the second uh, use way to look at it is once these things are connected we can actually look into our uh, whip in our plants that means work in progress so i can actually figure out uh, you know is this picture uh, supposed to be spending three hours in this particular location you know how often it's used uh, and then where 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 in particular plant uh, the, at any particular time uh, the assembly of the engine or assembly of the plant, uh, product uh, is spending most of the time. And in, in, by looking at this, I can easily uh, bring my work in progress or my whip down and, and increase the efficiency of the plant. So indoor technologies, uh, we went with BLE solution in this case because the fixtures were quite large. I can see this fixture um, uh, easily from uh, you know, a five meter or 10 meter space. So we were not looking for uh, a, a solution that can, that, uh, that can give us a centimeter level of accuracy. So BLE in this case was, was good enough to get started. But again, uh, we had it uh, in, in one platform where you know you have small trackers that connect to different assets, and you have a platform where operators can not only have a mobile app and, and uh, a web tool to visualize uh, or spec the diagram of your assets uh, within the plant. So these are the three use cases uh, you know that we have applied for track and trace technologies within Rolls Royce, uh, and hopefully this gives you an idea on tracking technologies uh, and use cases. Uh, from manufacturing also to MRO space uh, and also to connected uh, products. And the connected product space is basically a space where uh, we, we not only now have a new relationship with, with our customers, uh, but in turn, it can also bring new revenues, uh, future revenues for the company. Can we move to the next slide? So now this brings uh, us to a time where we're uh, interest, uh, right on time uh, to answer some of the Q and A's. Yeah. Uh, so, Devin, over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Sachin, for your presentation. Uh, I'm sure all of no us problem. were able to uh, gain insight into the wonderful world of IIoT. And uh, I, think, I think, you know, we can see how it really shapes industry forces. So, uh, as we enter our Q&A segment, I have with me here a list of questions that uh, the participants have either shared with me privately or through the chat function below. So, uh, let's start with the first one, right? Uh, let's see. Hold on. Yeah, so uh, from Yap YL, she's asking, what is the communication range and bandwidth that uh, Changi T4 is applying to do? Yes. Well, I don't think I, I can answer the question uh, for Changi. Uh, we typically work on the maintenance side of the engine, not on the airport side. So for us, the technologies uh, will involve uh, in tracking our engine spare parts, tools, assets. Uh, uh, within the airport uh, uh, area, while Changi will have a different requirements of uh, you know uh, providing businesses or retail services and many other services to track and you know even people services whether there are right number of uh, you know uh, how is the queue in the immigration how is the toilet cleans uh, how is the queue in the retail shop so it depends on uh, different use cases to use cases uh, where I'm coming from you will choose a technology and then then go with it. Okay, uh, next question we have is, uh, how is Rolls-Royce working with startups to co-create new offerings for the future? Yeah, so uh, what usually comes first, the tech or the use case? Sure, so I think that's a very good question because uh, Rolls-Royce, as I was saying, uh, we, we have a large ecosystem and we, we kind of uh, have uh, about 31 uh, UTCs globally. Uh, when I say UTCs, they are the University Technology uh, Centers. 
Uh, Singapore is the largest uh, UTC globally. We've got uh, uh, with NTU, uh, but we believe in co-creation. So uh, we work with startups in various cases. And just last year, uh, we have an ecosystem team uh, within uh, Rolls Royce, which uh, looks at uh, uh, digital challenges. Uh, we invite uh, startup companies to come and pitch uh, what can be done in MRO space, or how can they help solve some of our challenges. And then we work with, on, uh, with them, uh, develop some uh, interesting uh, solutions, and that can be applied uh, throughout our businesses from design to manufacturing to MRO space. Just to give you an example, last year, just late last year in Singapore, uh, we launched a, a blockchain challenge together with Enterprise SG. And uh, we selected uh, one of the startup companies out of Hong Kong to come and uh, help us uh, with what, how blockchain can help in the MRO space. And again, uh, how can they integrate IoT data uh, and, and show us a digital thread uh, of the engine as it comes to, uh, once it lands into the airport and as it goes from uh, airport to power plant shop to, to our MRO facility and then vice versa back. So we work with startups in different ways and uh, we, we believe in co-creation. And then, but just on the second part of the question, which was again interesting is what comes uh, first? Uh, what we believe is there has to have a problem to solve. And 90% of the cases, uh, we are solving a problem. So we have a problem first and, you know, uh, then you look for a technology. What's the technology, uh, you know, you're looking to solve that problem. Not the other way around that you have a technology first and then you're looking for a problem. So uh, once, you, once you have, a, you know, uh, uh, and understanding a problem goes into uh, different ways. So you, we need to do a deep dive into requirement capture. We need to look into what is the business canvas, what is the ROI of it, and then then go on choosing the right technology, applying it. Hmm. I see. So uh, I think it's interesting to note that uh, Rolls Royce does more than just hardware. There's also the there are software solutions that are that are present within Rolls Royce itself. So. Uh, one question that we received is, uh, what are the key challenges that you know Rolls Royce sees in this deploying IoT solutions for various SMEs and different companies? Sure, I think uh, there there are few challenges uh, uh, when it comes to deploying IoT. Right. So first challenge, as I said, we just spoke about it, is is the business case. Right. Yeah. What problem are we trying to solve? Uh, is it just a technology for the sake of, uh, you know, doing a proof of concept or is there is a real problem that we are trying to solve? Often, uh, you know, people just uh, fail to describe the problem statement. So, you know, we, we need to ensure that, you know, uh, we get a problem statement correct uh, and then uh, select the right technology to uh, solve the problem. The second thing is uh, productionization. So when it comes to productionization, so doing POC and the MVPs is the easy part. Uh, productionization is, is a big part of it, right? Because uh, if you don't have a right productionization strategy, uh, the POCs or whatever the hard work we have done so far will fail because uh, productionization of a particular technology needs uh, uh, what happens if something goes wrong, which number of, uh, uh, an operator will call, uh, if it goes wrong. So you, so we need to select partners who can provide uh, uh, global support, who have presence everywhere. How do we train our operators to uh, to be uh, digital savvy, to think digitally, to, to have that agile mindset uh, when it comes to production of those technologies. So production to me is, is one of the biggest challenges uh, in this industry at this moment. Mm. Okay. Then, uh, so I just received this question. Uh, are yeah. all your solutions built in-house or do you work with vendors? When should a company consider building the IoT capabilities in-house? Yeah. So I think it's, it goes back to the initial slides where I was mentioning, you know, what, how do we look at today's technology and how do we look at future technology, right? And the make and buy decision is, is essentially, can, can I just buy a technology that's available today outside and it's low cost? Uh, can I just not acquire the technology and get going and, you know, get benefits out of it very quickly? Uh, the, the, the make decision comes when, you know, uh, you want to create something different. Uh, there is an IP that we're trying to generate, uh, or that's something going to help us in long run, uh, and in, in com or give, will give us a competitive edge, or there's a, you know, uh, a uh, new offering or product that we're going to take to the market. That's when you're looking at the uh, make decision. Otherwise, 
I'll say the buy decision and IoT technology today is, is available so uh, much in, in, in the market and then low cost that I'll say the, the first point will be to just take and, and acquire and apply the technology immediately. Okay. Mm, let's see. Uh, yeah, so another question. Was there a situation whether within a Rolls Royce or from what you personally have learned through industry connections in which the uh, industry of things technology was not the best solution for the problem because you know there are many ways to skin a cat. Correct. So I think it goes back to requirement capture, right? Because uh, my definition of a product and your definition of a product can be very different definitions. And uh, often uh, what I've seen and what I've learned in, in many years is uh, uh, we have not, if we don't do a proper requirement capture, uh, the product actually uh, comes out as a disaster, right? Because we think that this technology can be applied and this is to be done with IoT, uh, but the product actually that the customer owner was thinking was totally different thing, right? So first of all, you know, uh, having a clear vision of requirements, having a clear vision of uh, problem statement is important. And then secondly, you know, uh, IoT is, is not just uh, uh, limited to things that are available today, right? IoT only comes where uh, we are applying uh, computerization or sensing technologies to things that were not connected before. So if you already have a box that, you know, that's connected and, you know, uh, that can give us data that we need, uh, we don't need to apply a new IoT sensors or new technology. So for example, uh, if there's a PLC in a machine uh, and that PLC can give us a uh, you know, similar amount of data, the you know, start and stop time of the machine, the vibration data, the failure modes, I don't need uh, anything else. I can just take that PLC data, convert it into OPC UA, and then you know, straight away get going uh, with my predictive uh, uh, maintenance solution. But if there's a machine that does not have a PLC or that doesn't have uh, any other uh, uh, common technology, today's technology that gives us that answer, then I'll need a new type of sensors or new type of communication devices to collect that similar data and then build the predictive maintenance models. So it it depends on what we are trying to solve and you know how we'll go about solving that problem. Hope that helps. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a question from one of the members of the audience. Uh, they're, they're asking, how many engineers are involved in the Rolls Royce IIoT uh, implementation? And you know, uh, if if we were to break down the the workforce in in this implementation, how much of it is local, and how much of it is, comes from a foreign foreign labor? So, uh, for IoT for us is split between the UK and Singapore. So there's a group uh, that does uh, you know certain things in in UK. And there's a group that I lead uh, out of Singapore where we look at uh, working with universities, uh, which is essentially we have about a team of 10 uh, or more in, in the uh, program with the NTU. Uh, we, we work with ASTAR, which is uh, again, a local organization. We have a, a IIoT initiative, which is about uh, 15 of our people over there in IQ. And then we have a team in Celatar, uh, which is a relatively small team. Uh, and then, you know, we, we multiply ourselves when it's needed, uh, whether we, we imply, uh, use capability teams from factory floors or we use uh, uh, capability teams from NTU or IQ uh, to deliver the project. Okay, yeah, okay, so. But essentially yeah. local, uh, wherever we go, yeah. Yeah, okay, so uh, I do personally have a question for you. Uh, yeah. So, you know, if, if this solution requires the data from the third party, right? So uh, how do you think as, you know, uh, SMEs or smaller companies in, in Singapore, how do you think we should approach or work out data ownership rights? Hmm. That's a very good question because uh, I think data ownership is a, is a big thing right now. And first of all, you, again, we need to know whom does the data belongs to, right? So just by having an asset in airport doesn't mean that data belongs to me. Actually, the data may, uh, belongs to our customer, right? because they are the one who are the essential owners of, uh, of the data. So ultimately we need permission from, from the customer first uh, to see if we can collect the data, process it, and then give value back to them, right? So it, it is important to understand uh, when, it, when, when we start uh, the IoT journey, who is the owner of that data? Who owns that particular machine? Who owns that, that asset? And then you know uh, go from there, that's the first step. The second step will be, is that data, 
how you handle the data, right? So is that is there any export control uh, limitations into that data? That means I can't share it uh, outside of Singapore. I can't share it within certain groups. Uh, how I handle the data, whether it's going to be an in-house cloud or whether it's an on-premise cloud or whether it's going to be a public. Uh, uh, so data classification is, is a big thing. Uh, so in order to, for me to need no data, uh, to start from data ownership, it goes into data classification then. So once I classify the data, what type of data it is and you know, how do I handle the data, uh, that, that will bring to the data storage and, and, and processing and applying of the data and give, giving value back to the customer. Okay. Uh, I do believe a member of the audience, uh, Mr. James Wong has a question to ask. Mr. James? You're mute. Hello. Hello, can you hear? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, I'd like to check with you. Uh, when you have the, uh, the software ready, and then uh, you try to, of course, implement it, introduce to the company, what are the greatest challenge that you actually encounter or face? I think, as I said earlier, the biggest challenge for us is uh, productionization, right? So in Rolls-Royce, we typically uh, use a journey called as TRL or MCRL. I'm not sure you're familiar with it. So TRL stands for technology readiness level and MCRL is a manufacturing technology readiness level. So TRL one to three is basically a technology uh, which is very at the early stage. You have an idea, you're working with a university, uh, you get that idea up into some level of maturity. Uh, TRL four to five is that's where you're doing proof of concept. Uh, of that, uh, uh, you know, whether it's software or hardware, uh, you know, you've done a proof of concept. TRL 5 to 7 is uh, about developing an MVP, a minimum viable product, but it's now within the IT environment, within the environment of Rolls Royce or your own company. That means, you know, you, you're now applying the security architecture across it. You're now applying, uh, you're, you're basically working with your IT organization to making sure that it, it, it is, uh, uh, it applies and it's it's uh, bounded by all the other uh, IT regulations of the company. And then TRL 7 to 10 is all about productionization. And then productionization where it comes is who will provide the support, whether it's internal IT or whether we need a third party company to come and provide the support. And then, you know, how do we scale it, right? Uh, what kind of licenses we so, uh, will need, whether it's one or 10 or go from there. But I think the essential stage is, is between TRL 4 to 6 where, uh, you know, POC, once the POC is done, we work with the uh, uh, inside organization and see, you know, how can we bring it uh, within our organization regulations and uh, ensuring that everything, uh, it meets all our uh, requirements from security and uh, reliability and scalability pers uh, perspective. Okay, okay. When, when, when you uh, sort of introducing this new product into your company, of course, uh, the user got to buy in and then user got to be trained. Uh, now, how do you manage uh, this area? Maybe you can share your experience. Sure, uh, but it goes back to, to earlier conversation that whether it's a tech first or the use case first, right? Mm -hmm. So for us, uh, uh, it's always the use case first. So that means there is a business uh, problem that we're trying to solve. And the business problem means there is a business owner so whether it's a you know, factory uh, plant uh, manager or, or, or lead uh, who is telling us that this machine breaks up 10 times in a day but I'm not able to collect the data, I can't find my asset in this factory and I'm losing this productivity. So ultimately the problem is defined from the owner first, right? Once you have a technology, uh, you, you're working on a sprint basis. So we're not basically you know, uh, looking at uh, one year program or two years program where we take this problem and you know we develop something and go back to him after one year only. So in sprints, we actually do uh, typically three weeks or one week, one month or two months kind of a projects. And each sprint, we will have regular interactions with the business uh, owners uh, every week. So there will be weekly call, there will be bi-weekly meetings, ensuring is this correct? Is this what you want? Is this going to meet your requirement? And at the end of the sprint, we hand over the project. He was already involved in most of the journey. And uh, he, he then owns the process and he owns the solution to take it forward. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. I think when we talk about uh, going into the uh, internet, we always have a, a, a big concern about uh, you know, a cyber attack and so on and so forth. How do you manage this, uh, this area? 
I think cyber attacks and cybersecurity is going to stay for some time. And uh, it it's can't be looked at just one area, right? You have to look at the holistic approach of the entire program. How do you secure sensors? How do we secure gateways? How do we secure software? Who will have access to the software? Who has access to the site? Uh, where the data resides, whether it's on-premise or public cloud. So I think it, it, it's a bigger end-to-end -end, uh, security that we are looking at, right? And ISA uh, 27001 standard that we typically follow uh, looks at different broad range of uh, security. Uh, so we have a, a IT uh, security team that we work with uh, on hand-to-hand, -hand, uh, which helps us in the different processes and guides us that this, how do we validate this sensor? How do we validate this gateway? How do we validate the software process and ensuring that again, you know, uh, we are not violating any regulations of the company when we hand over the solution to the business owner. But security is something, it's, it's a topic that's going to take another one hour for our <laughs> uh, for a conversation uh, because uh, it, it needs to be looked end to end, not just uh, from sensor perspective. Mm -hmm. so, okay, uh, there are one more question I'd like to ask. Uh, sorry, I'm uh, asking too many questions. <laughs> uh, when the uh, emerging of uh, the 5G technology, do you think that uh, it will make your, 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 your software or your application or your apps uh, more attractive? Do you, do you think that uh, it will help a lot in your, your, your these apps? At this moment, uh, we are exploring, trying to understand uh, how 5G is going to help us. I think uh, we've got a test bed at uh, ARTC where we're going to look at uh, different use cases uh, of uh, Industry 4.0 connecting sensors. Uh, 5G is going to help where you know you have applications uh, which are low latency applications, right? And today, if you ask me, I think if we get data, if it comes after one minute also, I'm fine. Um, I don't have any application where I can say I need data of milliseconds or you know five milliseconds kind of thing. So it's going to take a journey for us to understand and also how uh, for telecom players to understand you know our requirements. And when we come together, I, I think it's a great technology is going to happen uh, for sure. Uh, but it's just a matter of time how uh, industry is going to adopt it. So everybody is exploring right now uh, 5G as we speak. Yeah, yeah. I think give give other 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 participants a chance to ask question. <laughs> thank, you. Back to you. Thank, thank you, Mr. James. Thank you for your very wonderful questions. Uh, I think in the interest of time, I think that will be the last question that we'll be taking today. Uh, do yeah. join us for our next training seminar that will be have, uh, we will be sending you the EDM soon to have all, that has all the details. Right? Uh, once again, thank you, Mr. Sachin, uh, Mr. Target, and uh, we hope to see you for our next session. Thank you. Thank you, Darwin. Thank, thank you, you Rajinda. Thank, thank you for inviting me. Have a good day. Mm -hmm. Bye for now.